When I speak your word, Father, these people won't see me. They will hear and see the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Father God, that you rule and you reign in this house. And I give you the thanks now. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen. Amen. So last time we spoke about a man named Naaman. And he almost missed his miracle, beloved, because of pride. I would suggest that you get that CD or go on YouTube and listen to that message. It was quite interesting. So we can do a lot of things wrong when we are in a prideful place. This week, I want to read some of the words of King David, which were the very opposite of Naaman's words. So let's turn in our Bibles to Psalm 139. Psalm 139, and we're going to read verses 23 and 24 in the Amplified Version of the Bible. Psalm 139. Listen to David's heart. Search me thoroughly, O God. You see, that's why the Scripture is very clear about his life. That's why the, the Lord called him a man after his own heart. Because David was humbled before the Lord. You have to understand, this is a king speaking here. This is a man that has a great authority. And, and every, everywhere he looked belonged to him. Uh, every, every little hamlet, every, every little nook, everywhere in, in Israel, as far as his eye could see, he was the ruler and beyond. And here he was humbling himself before God. That should teach every one of us, beloved, an awesome, awesome lesson. Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. You see, you might think you know what somebody's thinking, and sometimes you're pretty close, but you don't know the deepest crevices of that person's uh, thoughts. You don't know what's going on in the, the deepest part of their hearts. You don't know what's going on in their soulish realm. Only God Almighty knows the heart of man. We can assume, and that can be dangerous, but God knows our hearts, and he knew David's heart. And David continues to say, to say, and see if there is any wicked or hurtful way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. See if there be any hurtful, evil way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Obviously, King David believed in life hereafter. King David believed that when he would exit this world, that he would be in another place with God. So when we test or we, we ask God to test our hearts and to, to see what's in there, I think you'll be surprised at some of the things you find. You know, it just was yesterday, and it's, it's amazing because I've found something out over the years, and I've been teaching and preaching a long time, beloved. But I found out something. Whatever I teach on or preach on, I'll be tested on. I'll be tested to see if I'm going to do what I tell you to do, because that's pleasing to God. And if I'm telling you to do something that I won't do, that's not pleasing to God. Because I'm not up here to dictate the Word of God. I'm up here to teach it and preach it as the Holy Spirit would have me do. And I found myself in a situation in a phone call yesterday. And it was amazing because once I hung up the phone, I spoke to the Lord. I said, that was very selfish of me, wasn't it, Lord? It wasn't a big, big deal. You, you probably wouldn't have thought anything about what I had said and done. Nothing. It was not a huge, um, you know, big, big black thing. No. But in my heart, because, and I say this humbly before the Lord, I keep my heart very, very tender. I don't allow anything, anything to keep me from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ, my Lord. And so I hung up the phone and I said, that was selfish of me, wasn't it, Lord? And the Lord spoke back to me and said, yes, it was. And I said, okay, I'll call back. And I did. 
And I called back, and to the best of my ability, I put what I said right. And the person that I was speaking to hadn't a clue what I was talking about. Because God was searching my heart. They said, Pastor, that's okay. There's not a problem. I said, to me, there was a problem. You see, once you start teaching this, it gets deep. There's things way down deep inside of us we don't know. But God does. And when he brings them to the surface, it's up to you and I to do something about it. You see, your character is not revealed by your actions. Your character is revealed by your reactions. Actions can be planned, but reactions are spontaneous. They give you a glimpse of what is really in your heart so that you can look at it honestly and deal with it. Perhaps you need the very storm from which you have been trying to run from. Could God be perfecting that thing that concerns you and I? Now, that's not always the case, but it is a possibility. You see, we all live to a degree in denial until we are brought face to face with the contents of our own hearts. Would you readily admit, would I readily admit that I'm greedy, that lustful, tearful, or or fearful rather, or insecure? Would I readily admit these? Would I readily say, uh, uh, you know, would I readily say that I'm I'm jealous or resentful of the blessing of God and the lives of others? You ever believe God for anything? Excuse me. And you, you know, you, the person that you, the thing you're believing for, God gave to somebody else. Hallelujah. I've seen that in my life, Hallelujah. and I've said, Lord, what, what, what end of the line was that? How come they got that? Amen. And then I had to search my own heart, and that's many, many years ago. But I do remember one thing that that uh, years ago I heard Joyce Meyer say that she was believing God for a coat, some kind of fur coat or something, and this woman walked into the church with her coat. You know, she, I remember that distinctly. It was many years ago, but she, she said, boy, did I have to search my heart. Hallelujah. So we're not going to, you know, are we resentful of the blessing of God on the lives of others? Probably not, but you never know. You have to find out. When David prayed, search me, O God, and know my heart, he was inviting God to create the circumstances that would surface in him all the stuff that was on the bottom of the lake. All the stuff, beloved, that was hidden from view. Not only from the eyes of other people, but from our own eyes. You know, Robert Burns, the great Scottish poet, poet, said these words, Oh, what a gift to give us to see ourselves as others see us. I'll translate it. God has given you a gift, a great gift, if you can see yourself the way others see you. I guess he had some wisdom way back then. But the most dangerous lies, beloved, are not the ones we tell other people. They are the ones that we tell ourselves and learn to live with comfortably. Let me say something to you this morning. Whatever you compromise to keep, you will eventually lose. It's just that simple. It is just that simple. Trust me, I've saw it over and over and over again. Whatever you compromise, you will eventually lose. And what, you know, what what you allow, what, you know, in your life, everything is a cycle. Everything is a seed. You have to know the seeds that you're planting in your life because they're all going to spring up sooner or later unless you cancel certain ones from your heart speaking from your mouth. But you see, at the end of the day, beloved, that's what I'm talking about. The the things we tell ourselves and convince ourselves, but can I say something to you? Whatever you justify, you buy. I can justify every day of my life but I will not do it. If I know, if I know, now again, there's things even hidden from us till God shows us. But if I know in my heart 
I will not be able to justify it. Are you hearing me Amen. today? This message is called, Go All the Way with God. I, think, I don't think I even said that today. I'm not sure. But that's what God's saying to me. This is not a time to be lukewarm. This is not a time to walk away from your post. This is not a time to slacken off. If ever we have been living in a time when God's speaking to his people about getting close to him and going all the way with him, it's not how you begin, beloved. It's how you end. I've known a lot of people that began, whoa, 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 on fire for God. I don't even see them in church today. I don't, many ministers, do you, if I was to tell you the ratio of, of the ministers that quit, quit the ministry within five years, you'd be, a, you'd be shocked. I don't have the figures in front of me or I would. If you can last five years today in the ministry, that's supposed to be an, a, a, a real big thing. And really, you've done well. Well, I guess, thank you, Jesus. We're doing okay. We're 40 years. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. And I'll be honest with you, I've had to search my heart and, and I've had to see the pride in my heart because truthfully, you've heard me say this before, but it's worth repeating. When I first got saved, I thought I was sa saving the whole world within five minutes. I really did. I mean, that's exaggeration, but you know what I mean. And I look and I, and I think of the, you know, the hundreds and hundreds of people that go to other churches and that's wonderful and that's great. Well, I'd be lying to you if I didn't want to tell you that I want to see every single seat in here filled. Of course I do. I want to go into two services. Of course I do. We want to build out here. Of course I do. But you know what I've learned? God's timing is perfect. And I've learned to, I've learned to say in my heart, unless you build this house, I labor in vain, beloved. I labor in vain. You labor in vain. Unless the, the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen watch in vain. And so in my heart, I, had to, I have to say to God constantly, Lord, I have the cream of the crop. Amen. I would rather have quality than quantity. Amen. Quantity is not always the best thing in a church. Amen. Let me tell you, because we deal with all kinds of issues, all kinds of personalities. But at least I know our people, and you are wonderful. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I really do mean it. So uh, is numbers important? Yes, to see people get saved. But it's not what it's all about. You see, the scripture is very clear that God will always have a remnant. A remnant means a very small group of people. A very, very small group. But they're committed to God. You know. I know I'm going off my notes again. Hallelujah. But I looked up here at this music ministry today. Hallelujah. And I looked at these young people. And I said to myself, and in fact, I turned around to my daughter and whispered, look how faithful they are. Do you know what many, many pastors would give to half what we have? My God. These people do what they are doing from their hearts. Because they love God. You know what they're doing? They're going all the way with God. Amen. That's what it's all about, beloved. Oh, there'll be times when things will be said, you know, when you're growing pains yes, and, right. and you know that you've got a choice to take an offense or get That's over right. it. That's right. But we have came through so much together. Hallelujah. And they're so precious to God. I look at the ushers, the greeters, the people that are ministering in the junior church. And I think they're going all the way. Commitment, loyalty, all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. Oh, hallelujah. King David, search me, oh God. Know me, know my heart. Know if there be any evil work in me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You see, the things that we tell ourselves and believe, we can learn to live with, as I said earlier, comfortably. But it's not the best. The goal is until Christ be formed in us. Galatians 4.9. 
Do we realise today, beloved, what Paul was saying? To become so much like Jesus that you too can say, when they cut you, you'll bleed Jesus. That's a big one. Ask God today to search and surface in you anything, no matter how teeny, teeny, weeny or small it might be, anything that separates you from him. And watch God manifest great blessings in your life. I know. I'm a recipient of that. I see the blessings of God in my life. I don't stand here ever bragging in me. I brag in Jesus in me. Hallelujah. Don't let anything separate you from him. And as you continue to go all the way with him, you will see. You will see the blessings of God. You know, when I was saying about when they cut you, bleed Jesus. I, I, I'm thinking of David Wilkerson up in New York City. I haven't thought about this in many, many years. And he, he um, was standing in front of a, a, a gang a leader at that time called Nicky Cruz, I believe, right? Nicky Cruz. And Nicky Cruz had a knife in his ham, hand and he was going right up to David Wilkerson with, to, to kill him. And David Wilkerson stood there and he said, Nicky, do whatever you want to do. But he says, if you kill me, cut me in little pieces and every piece will call out to you. I love you and so does Jesus. Nicky Cruz fell to the ground on his face before God that day and got saved and became a worldwide evangelist. But what I'm saying to you today is what happened to Nicky Cruz? He saw the power of love and he lost the love of power. That's what happened to him. Jesus. That's what happened to this lady in 1977. When I lay in my basement floor before God Almighty, I saw the love of God. And I surrendered everything I had to Jesus that night. I said, if you'll lose a, use a sinner like me right. and somebody as daft as me, I said, you, you know, you'll use anybody. I'm here, I'm available. He's not looking for, for your qualities and your, your, all the things you've learned. He's looking for your availability. Not your ability, your availability. And that night when I cried out to God, I said, Lord, I'm yours. And I can stand before you. I can stand before any human being in the face of this earth. And I can tell you, I've never lost my first love. Never. Yeah, there may have been times I've been under pressure. Yes, there may have been times where, you know, I waned a little bit and asked questions like every one of you. Going through very, very challenging times in my life. I've cried out to God just like you. Where are you? Why did this happen? But I'm here to tell you, he's never stopped holding me. And I've held on to that nail-scarred hand for 40 years. Hallelujah. I went all the way with God. That's why I can stand here today and tell you what I'm telling you. Go all the way. Don't go halfway. Hopefully someday. You know, we hear people, they're always in tomorrow. Yes. Tomorrow I'll do it. Tomorrow. Yes. Tomorrow I'll pray. Tomorrow I'll read the word. Tomorrow. No. Sometimes, beloved, tomorrow doesn't come. Yes. Listen to one that knows. The Bible tells us in Mark 4.35, Jesus' words, let us pass over to the other side. In other words, go all the way. Let me say something to you this morning, beloved, and I hope you hear me. The one thing that the enemy doesn't want you to do is to get through whatever you're coming through right now and reach the other side. And if I was to ask a question in here, talk to you personally in here, everyone in this room and by, via uh, YouTube and what have you in the internet, every single person is going through something. Yes. And the devil wants you to think you're the only one going through it. You're not. And you will get to the other side. He doesn't want you to get through and reach the other side. He doesn't care if you go to church. He doesn't care if you're in the choir. <coughs> he just 
doesn't want you to reach your destiny. Amen. He doesn't care if you usher your grief. He doesn't care about any of these things. He doesn't want you to reach your destiny. But what's waiting for you on the other side is worth it. And I'm not just talking about heaven. I'm talking about here. On the other side of your problem, it's going to be worth it to you. Everything you are going through at this moment is nothing. Paul says, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And what happens when we do that, beloved? And the peace of God, trust me, it happens. The peace of God, which passes all understanding. Have you ever been there? When you're in this bubble, you're in this place of peace, and you think, how can I have this peace? It's God. It passes all understanding, and it will keep your heart and minds through Christ Jesus, Philippians 4, 6. Change is not cheap, and it sure isn't easy. But before there is a resurrection, there must be a cross. There will be things that God will require of you. Are you willing to go all the way? Paul said, when I was a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I believe it's time, beloved. It's time to stop thinking like a child. You've got to put it all away and grow up. No one can do it for you. You alone has to make that painful sacrifice before God. Without it, you'll never reach the blessings of God that God has waiting for you right now. He said, my blessings are many, but we can't get out of ourselves to see what God's trying to do in our lives. <coughs> Excuse me. What do you need to change today? What do I need to change today? I ask myself these things before I minister to you. Do I need to change my schedule to yes. make room for God? Hallelujah. My friends, because they're robbing me of my strength. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Hallelujah. If you have worldly friends, they can be robbing you of your strength and your spirituality. Your habits, because they're draining and defeating you. Here's the big one. Your words. Your words. Do you need to change your words? Because you're speaking unbelief instead of faith. And you'll come to a place, and I have. Many times I've said to the Lord, Lord, I believe. Help me my unbelief. Amen. Or help thou my unbelief. Because we all go through those moments of doubt. We all go through the moments when, when, you know, the battlefield, beloved, is the mind. Trust me, it is. I've laid awake many, many nights. Many nights. Trying to, trying to, to do what I'm telling you the Word says to do. Because we're all in this flesh. And believe me when I tell you, beloved, it's not an easy road. When your mind is going like a, a peery, as we used to say in Scotland, you know those things that the children used to, you know, press down like this and they go, ooh, that's how my mind goes. Ooh, I, must, I wonder what I look like on YouTube. Ooh. <laughs> but that's the truth. And I have to get myself. And I have to speak the word to myself. Why art thou disquieted within me, O my soul? Trust thou in God. I've screamed that up in the night season in my room. Get a grip. You can't turn the clock back. You've only got today. <coughs> Hallelujah. So your words. Today, beloved, get into his presence and ask him to help you get through Whatever you are trying to get through, he will help you. You see, we get so engrossed with things. And then we see thing, then we see on television what is happening in the great state of Texas. 
and we see everyone come, well, most people coming together, and the church is opening up the doors. I mean, it's just an amazing thing, and I can tell you, it is being watched. All over this world, it's being watched, and there's no country no country in this world that can even touch the United States of America. And they see something. Teresa said it before she prayed. They see something in America. They see it. They see. You don't go into many countries and, and, and see them praying over their meals. You, you, if you sneeze, I can tell you in Scotland, if I sneeze, nobody's going to say to me, God bless you. It's foreign. But not in America. Why? Because this is our foundation. And God wants to build on that foundation. This generation coming up, beloved, you know my heart when I say this. This is what I live for. To see this generation come forward. With what? With the blood-stained banner. A group of people that are not ashamed of the blood that know where their salvation comes from. So we think about all these things and, oh, well, you know, and, I, and, and it's serious. We understand. But the greatest testimonies coming out of Texas is when we hear people say things like, I'm so thankful for my life. That, that responder came and saved my whole family. And then you hear others say, uh, the, the, the house can be replaced. And it can, yeah. eventually. Yeah. I'm not making light of any of this. But if we put it into perspective, the greatest things in life are not things. Real joy and peace, real purpose in life are found only in Jesus. No storm, no hurricane, no earthquake can ever take him away. He'll be there with you. He'll see you through every storm you ever have to ever encounter. Just go all the way. Surrender to him. You know, we used to sing that song many years ago. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Boy, it's the truth. Considering the fact that the boat was filled with water, just filled, it's amazing that the disciples had to awaken the Lord. As I've said before, this was not a large ship with cabins below deck. No, it was just a small little dinghy. We've seen them many times when I went to Israel. Just little boats in the, in, in, out in the, the Sea of Galilee. It was an open boat. Jesus was no doubt soaked to the bone. This reflects Jesus' humanity to us. He must have been really tired, beloved, that could sleep with his soaking wet clothes on. Medical science has discovered that the deeper we sleep, the more rest our bodies get. This is a clue, a clue as to how Jesus could maintain the grueling pace that he kept along with all night prayer and everything else. Jesus did not say, oh, let us go into the midst of the storm and drown. No. He was going to the other side. You see, his words preceded his actions. His word preceded his destiny. Come, let us go to the other side. Just like Abraham when he took Isaac up Mount Moriah. What did he say to the servants before he took him up? I and the boy shall return. He knew no matter what God told him to do, that boy was coming back with him because he was the promise. He was the child of laughter. He was the promise of God to Abraham for his seed and his seed, seed for for generations to come, thousands of years. God's gave you a promise today. You know what it is. He's gave me a promise. Everyone in this room has something they're holding on to. Don't ever, ever let it go. 
So Jesus didn't say, we're going we're gonna to drown out here. No. They hadn't yet realized that Jesus was Lord even over the physical elements. All of a sudden, they see it. Many Christians do this today, beloved. They receive the spiritual benefits of salvation, but have not reaped the physical benefits of health and prosperity, which are also a part of our salvation. You see, this is how I say it. I have things. Things don't have me. Amen. That's the difference in all of this. When I say prosperity, everyone sees dollar bills things. No. You know how many people would give everything they own to have peace of mind? That's right. Everything they own to have to not go to a doctor and, and do whatever they have to do. You, you've got millionaires, billionaires yeah, right. that would pay you cash to have your health. Amen. That's what I say every day to God. And I mean every day. God, thank you for my health. Amen. Thank you for my strength. No matter how much wind and, and storm comes in the boat, yes. I'm going to be like Jesus. He was laying there, the Bible says, in the hinder part of the ship. And what did they say? Master, master, carest thou not that we perish? Yeah. I could just see Jesus. I believe Jesus had a sense of humor. Amen. I really do. He has to laugh when he looks at me. I know that. But I can tell you, beloved, he's laying there saying, really? Seriously? I just told you we're going to the other side. That's why I'm sleeping. And you're awake worrying. And I'm teaching that to me right now. Amen. How many of you can say amen? amen? He's gave us the promise, but we don't listen. We just keep on worry, worry, worry. Amen. Well, worry's like a rocking chair, beloved. You get plenty of exercise, but you get nowhere. Nowhere. So what do we want to focus on? The storm or the Lord in the midst of our storm? Whatever will determine how we manage the storms that we face in life. Le please hear me. He is not asleep concerning the things that we are facing. He's not asleep. He's right there in your ship and he's resting because he knows you're both going to get to the other side. His peace is yours. Believe his word and rest in his love. And Revelation 3, 2, and I'm going to be closing in a few moments, says this. Strengthen the things that remain. Get up and go on and go all the way with God. Be like the man who said, I'm never down. I'm either up or I'm getting up. Strengthen the things that remain. Go on with your life. You're in the ring with a strong, fierce opponent who wants to take you out. He knows that God has a special plan for your life but he doesn't have the power to take you out. The man or the woman who prays and stays close to God, he cannot do a thing to. Amen. Nothing. Make a commitment to stand in God's strength, regardless of what you're facing or how hard you've been hit. Give him a clear message with fire in your eyes. Tell him you're not throwing in the towel. No way. Paul says it this way, be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get. Every weapon God has issued so that when, when, you, when it's all over but the shouting, you will still be on your feet. Ephesians 6, 12, the Message Bible. You may have been to hell's door and back again for yourself and for your family. But you're going to win. Sooner or later, at the end of the day, there is an end. Tell the devil, you have been created in the image of his worth, worst nightmare. He hates you with a passion. Amen. God loves you with an everlasting love. Hallelujah. You're his worst nightmare. 
because you're created in the image and likeness of Almighty God. You're a resurrected man, a resurrected woman. You've been renewed in your faith and you're firm in your convictions. Let him know. I'll be knocked down, devil, but I'll be knocked down no lower than my knees. Many months ago, I was seeking the Lord and I recorded this word I'm going to speak to you in a few moments. I recorded this word in my phone. Believe that or not, I'm really getting high tech. <laughs> Hallelujah. I dated it at the time. These words are the words that God spoke to my heart when I was going through a very challenging time. Can anybody relate to a challenge? Yeah. Okay, so the other day there, I said, Lord, I don't want to bring the phone up here because sure enough, if I did, I know it's a negative confession, I'd probably lose it and then I'd have to go down and ask my daughter how to pull this back up again. So I said, God, how do I, how do I copy this from my phone to my copy machine in the house? Just like that, the Lord showed me this little button. Amen. And I pressed it and I heard ding, ding, and I knew my, it was copying. Wow, I said, I did it, I did it. Don't you love to achieve things? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, this is the word. Daniel 7.25. This is what God said to me. He said, open your Bible to Daniel. Okay. Where? Seventh chapter. Okay. What are you going to tell me? Satan seeks, seeks to wear out the saints of the Most High God. Do you know that's in the Bible? Daniel 7.25 says, Satan... That person's not your enemy. God's not your enemy. It's the enemy is the devil. And he seeks to wear you out. So I did a word study on this, and this is what I found. How does this wearing out take place? Often Satan's work is barely noticeable. He tries to wear us down gradually. A little here, a little there. Satan knows it takes more than one attack to wear us out. So he comes again and again. One way he tries to do this, and I know this is in my life, is to try to steal our time. Amen. He tries to make us focus and deal with all the troubles that he starts. He would like us to spend our lives, beloved, Spend our very lives trying to put out all the little fires yeah. that he began in the first place. As I said, that person's not your problem. Right. It's the enemy using them. It's the enemy causing the fires. It's the enemy causing the gossip. It's the enemy causing the strife. Where there's confusion and strife, there's every evil work. God's nowhere near that. Amen. And so... When I seen this, I realized that he starts and he wants us to spend our entire lives putting out fires. The scripture goes on to say, submit yourself to God. Go all the way. Resist the devil and he will flee from you, James 4, 7. Speak the word, beloved, over your family. Speak the word over your church. Speak the word over your brothers and your sisters in your church and in your natural family. Those who are in Christ, speak the word. They are your brothers. They are your sisters. And when you see your brother and sister, you're supposed to see Jesus Christ. What God has blessed, no man can curse. And that's this house. The prophetic word came over this house many, many, many years ago. What I have blessed, no man can curse. Are you hearing me today? Okay, I'm closing, but I have a little joke. Is that okay? There was a man who had been lost and walking in the desert for about two weeks. One hot day, he sees the home of a missionary. Tired and weak, he crawls up to the house and collapses on the doorstep. The missionary finds him and nurses him back to health. Feeling better, the man asks the missionary for directions to the nearest town. On his way out the back door, he sees this horse. 
He goes back into the house and asks the missionary, could I borrow your horse, please? I'll give it back to you when I reach the town. The missionary says, sure, no problem, but there's a special thing about this horse. You have to say, thank God to make it go and amen to make it stop. Not paying much attention, the man says, okay, fine, sure. So he gets on the horse and he says, thank God, and the horse starts walking. Then he says, thank God, thank God, and the horse starts trotting. Feeling very brave, the man says, thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God, and the, the horse takes off. Pretty soon he sees this cliff coming up, and he's doing everything he can to make the horse stop. What did he tell me? What did he tell me? Whoa, stop, hold on. Finally he remembers, amen. Ah. Oh. The horse stops four inches from the cliff. Then the man leads back in the saddle and says, thank God. <laughs> and don't you like a laugh when you come to church? When you walk out those doors, you'll see a sign up there that says, you're now entering, what? Does anyone know? The mission field. Now, or the harvest, whatever it says. It's been so long since I looked up there. But look when you go. Because I'm going to be saying something to you right now I want you to remember. People are not interested in all their problems. I've got enough of their own. But they want to see a smile. They want to hear a kind word. They want to hear somebody say to them, Jesus loves you. Amen? Amen. That's your great commission. Jesus loves you. Let's stand to our feet. God bless you this morning. Don't forget prayer Wednesday night, beloved. And I do want to say again, we thank God for all those who are traveling today for Labor Day that are not with us. They will return next week, I'm sure. And we thank God for safety. Amen. Are you in agreement with me? Thank you, Jesus. The Lord has blessed you. The Lord has kept you. The Lord has made his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord has lifted up his countenance upon you. And the Lord has given you peace. Music minister, would you come, please? Thank you. Today, we're going to close again with look what the Lord has done. Let, give them a big hand as they come. They deserve it. God bless you. Bless you.